by the end of it, it almost makes you think and no movies could ever be made again after Chinatown. I don't know if there's any other filmmaker I could just live with forever than Hitchcock. This movie changed cinema. Lester Banks said music will never be the same after The Velvet Underground. Brief Encounter, another perfect film. Fassbender once said, the best directors make the same film over and over and over again. So welcome in this Thank store. You. So before going through the movies, what are your relationship with that kind of store and with physical edition? They've meant so much to so many filmmakers I know and uh, the rise of the video. When I was a child, I had a fantasy that you could go to a store and you could go up to the counter and you could say, I want to see this movie. And they would have every movie mm -hmm. in the world and you could get it at the counter and they would hand it to you. So my dream came true. I was just talking about the Clips, the clips the other night with uh, my friend John Raymond, who just saw it, who had never seen it before. It's probably my favorite Antonioni film and the cinematography is just so unbelievable. And the sense of empty spaces and the, the location of that film and the, the camera work and the Monica Vitti aspect of the film is just uh, extraordinary. I was watching a lot of Monica Vitti for Carol, mm. actually, and, and some of her clothes inspired clothes that Carol would wear. She wears the boat neck cut mm. top. And I said to Sandy Powell, what about a boat neck? Mm. And Sandy was like, yes, yeah, she has <laughs> quite a nice neck. So we went with the boat neck. Murnau is, a, is is one of the great masters of silent cinema, and um, The Last Laugh is one of my absolute favorites. This brings me to a very important person in my life, who's Fassbender. It's very hard to pick a single Fassbender film. Mm. This is a consensus favorite of his, for obvious reasons. And uh, a remake, his own interpretation, of Cirque's All That Heaven Allows. So mm. it really uh, marks the moment when Fassbinder uh, encountered Douglas Cirque, and it really changed the kind of films that he was going to make from then on. And I don't know if he ever improved on anything in this than Ali Firid's The Soul, but he did variation. Fassbinder once said, the best directors make the same film over and over and over again. And he did that. Which other Fassbinder movie would you have picked? I would, I would pick this. It's an entire industry of cinema that he created within one lifetime. Mm. And it's an industry that reappraises a repressed German history, focused mostly on the Adenauer era, the post-war era. He did do Lily Marlene, which is a harder film to find because it was a studio production or something. Okay. It's harder to, and it's his only World War II era set film, fascinating, strange, Hannah Shagula, Marriage of Maria Braun, mm. Veronica Voss, and Lola. The BDR trilogy are just uh, super. I put a movie from a director that you know a little bit. I do, Kareem, he lived in New York City when we were all starting filmmaking. Kareem was our assistant editor on my first feature film, Poison. So he was studying film at the time. I was cutting the film in my apartment in Williamsburg, Brooklyn with Jim Lyons, my, uh, who starred in Poison, who was my lover, who was my partner, uh, who would edit all of my films um, as long as he was around. So it was Jim, me, and Kareem every day in my apartment. And uh, Kareem, I knew he was heading for yeah. an artistic career of his own that would be massive. That so I'm still catching up on Kareem movies. I can't, he's so prolific. And there's many that aren't in English and so he and he you know he's made films in spanish he means films in french he's yeah. made films in every language and he lives in now he lives in berlin and i saw him briefly at the Cannes film festival just yeah this last because uh, you had uh, he had a movie in competition, movie in in competition well. and me as well which and is amazing it was great it was so cool and he's like the same gorgeous face amazing dark brazilian eyes but a white beard, a white mustache, white hair, and then black eyebrows. So he looks like super cool. Uh, this actress, I've heard things about her. No, the last time I saw Kate was here in Paris in May. She came to the 
Pompidou Center, Center and uh, was here for the two screenings yeah. that sold out very quickly because people <laughs> knew Kate Blanchett was going to be there for Carol and for I'm Not There. Both films I had not watched, it seemed like, since they were made. And so I watched a screening of Carol before Kate arrived with a, a whole room full of high school students. And I, I, I couldn't remember exactly what happened next. I felt I found myself very much a spectator, moved by the story and, you know, anticipating hmm. the outcome of the romance. Of course, I did know, but I, I lived in that dual place. And then I sat with Kate watching I'm Not There. And I think I'm Not There was the film of mine that I saw at Pompidou that made the biggest impact on me this time. It really is a, it's a unique film, hmm. and it really does encompass the multitudes of this subject, Bob Dylan, and so many aspects of American culture and history in the 1960s with a shifting tonal, you know, mm. humor with Marcus Carl Smith, who plays young Woody, and just really amazing performances. Kate is sublime in her performance and she was Dylan, Bob Dylan's favorite and many people's favorite in the film. Charlotte Gainsbourg who plays opposite Heath Ledger in the in the story about the marriage is really where the heart and soul of that film penetrate and it was incredibly moving and I, I got to talk to Charlotte on Zoom she was got stuck in the south of France she was going to be in, there in person but man that and I, I wrote that part for Charlotte Gainsbourg mm -hmm. and made her a French uh, wife. Um, well, this movie can't, I don't know how it fell off my first top 10 list. It's on every top 10 list. Welcome, Mr. Kane. Welcome. It redefined how stories could be told, how the act of telling a story could be the story. And so no script would ever be the same after Citizen Kane. No way of looking at a sort of invisible, innocent way of telling a narrative could ever return to that unconsciousness mm. after Citizen Kane. So the sophistication, cinematically, narratively, of this film set a new standard for what was possible in cinema, in my opinion. Now, this man, who was a sort of later discovery in the auteur era. I've never felt this way before. Never so, so complete and so happy. He was in the, the next layer, the next sort of generation of, of artists who would be sort of reappraised on the heels of auteur theory. And very much, I think, in the guise of feminist film theory that was starting to, to take a different kind of serious look at melodrama. But Douglas Sirk, who was an intellectual, came out of theater, Europe, found, landed inexplicably at Universal Studios in the 1950s. It was handed all these, you know, ladies' home journal stories about domestic life in small, repressive towns and brought a level of complex understatement in the, in the mise-en-scene and the way he said his, the one thing he could say is his camera never failed him. And I think his camera was the critical perspective that he utilized to undermine what seemed to be the surface of those, of those stories. But they're among the most exquisite and complex and perfect films ever made. And, and that would include Imitation of Life, Written on the Wind, and All That Heaven Allows. Brief Encounter, another perfect film. <laughs> inspired the sort of structural mm. uh, book ending that I brought to the movie Carol. Uh, there's nothing like it. These er early David Lean films are quite remarkable, and this reached a balance between Noel Coward's writing and David Lean's cinematography and Celia Johnson's performance that is just one of those, you know, coming together moments of great artists. This movie is just the most Night of the Hunter. <laughs> It's experimental, but it, it, it anticipated independent cinema, underground cinema. It anticipated a kind of outer Hollywood way. It was a very low budget film. And the allegorical story that it tells has a simplicity about it and a beauty about it. And a, but also this profound um, sadness between the little boy and the way he sort of misapplies his affection for the Robert Mitchum character toward the end of the movie. It's a singular film because Charles Lawton, I don't think, ever made another film. No. Charles Lawton was a, 
amazing, brilliant actor. He was a progressive thinking, brilliant man. I, I, I don't know if there's any other filmmaker I could just live with forever than Hitchcock and watch them over and over again and learn something every time. <laughs> He embodies the entire history of cinema, but somebody who brought together the most subversive elements and the most popular elements of the medium. I, it just came as intuition to him, you know? It was his interest, it was his, his mistrust of power and his sense of always feeling implicitly guilty in our society, that he made the viewer feel implicitly mm -hmm like implicated in the criminality. And that's why it's always like an innocent guy who gets, you know, sucked into a crime mm. story. And he's all of us. We are all implicated mm. in the society. But then of course he's expanding the vernacular of cinema from film to film to film from the earliest all the way till the end of his career and, and collaborating with writers and amazing actors. And I, uh, he, he, again, encompasses all of it, like Fassbinder as this <laughs> subject of new German cinema. Okay, this man died when we were in pre-production uh, on May, December. Peut-être qu'un objet est ce qui permet de relier, de passer d'un sujet à l'autre, donc de vivre en société. There's just no more important uh, post-68 filmmaker than Godard, and Godard brought political discourse and critical thinking into a way of undermining and, and deconstructing narrative, popular form, but he loved and knew Hollywood narrative and genre so well. But the man never stopped collecting images and, con and contemplating the meaning of the production of image. This just happens to be one of my favorite, but it's an, again, it's very, very hard to pick a single Godard. I just go back to it so much. Oh, well, this. This guy inspired my first um, feature film, Poison. I have Thief's Journal with me on this trip. I want to reread it. I haven't read it in 20 years uh, because the film I'm developing right now with Joaquin Phoenix will return me to a sort of transgressive gay male love story, something that we invented ourselves, created from scratch the script based on Joaquin's instincts and desires and curiosities and uh, I watched Enchanté Moor at, at, at Pompidou. I thought I would just watch the beginning of it. It started playing at midnight or something after a very long day, and I, I couldn't move. And I forgot how radically explicit this film is, sexually and stunning. And I, we, we, there's a rumor that Jean Cocteau shot the movie. The cinematography is so beautiful, but I don't think... I'm sure it's documented somewhere. Yeah. This movie changed cinema. Tu lis comme ça tout le temps sans t'arrêter, tout à fait comme ton père. Oui, je sais, tu m'as déjà dit ça. I knew Chantal, and all of her films are fascinating, beautiful, thoughtful films. This particular film was a radical experiment in minimalist language. I think she hated that term. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also about telling the story of everything that most movies leave out of the story. And talking about the routines of domestic life and reducing down mm. the camera angles to the same exact repeating angles around that house and never venturing beyond that gorgeously limited vernacular but i remember watching it at Bra at brown in college and you know you're watching her make her coffee every morning mm. and do the same cups of coffee into the coffee pot and things are starting to unravel and two and a half hours into the movie she's making the coffee again the next morning and she puts in one extra spoon I think and everybody in the audience went oh. <laughs> it was just an amazing moment we can go to the Anglo section uh, section okay. over there oh yeah we didn't talk about um, Nashville unpack your bags and try not to cry. Altman in general. It's just a masterwork and it's such a remarkable film in its in the stories we hear about its process, the way it was made. His balance between a structured script and then improvisation, allowing this company of actors to be inventing their characters as they went along. But when you watch the finished film, it's so meticulously visualized. Every scene links together narratively, but it has a sense of it being loose and, you know, 
discovered in the process. Of course, every actor in it is also writing their own songs mm -hmm. and singing their own songs live on camera. I can't take no more, baby. So those demands that he put on the actors, the actors adored because they were given such liberty. Um, trust. You pass the joint around at the end of the day and go to the mm -hmm. dailies with Rob, with Bob, and it's a wide frame aspect ratio. So the it's just a beautiful looking film as well, mm -hmm. and had remarkable surprise performances by Lily Tomlin and Ronnie Blakely and Keith Carradine. I've made, uh, made uh, revealed an actress very important in your career in uh, Shortcuts. Hmm. I wonder who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We were trying to raise $1 million to make my second feature film safe, and we're having a very hard time. It took two years to raise the money for safe. I would have given up if it wasn't for Christine Vachon, my producer of all my movies. And she just said, if you really want to do this, we're going to do it. We're going to find it, the money. And at a certain point, somebody said, there's an actress whose name is starting to kick around Hollywood. She's not a big star but it might help that little bit. And we got to see an early cut before it was released of okay. shortcuts, screening of shortcuts. And um, of course it was as almost every single thing I've ever seen her do, an astonishing performance, a performance of quiet bravery and power. I don't think she's ever been given as challenging a role as she was in Safe. I love you. An almost unplayable, unimaginable subject who was sort of a conceptual void at the center of this idea of a person, of a woman. And she made it come to life. And she understood in a parallel world to mine what I was trying to do. And so we found this surprise um, confidence with each other, understanding with each other that just has continued in every film. May, December has a sweet thing about it because it returns Julianne Moore to the domestic setting this many years later in a relatively contemporary setting as Safe was, Safe, um, in, in 95. And so people who know that film can't help but see echoes of it in May, December. You're marking some of my peers from New Queer Cinema, Gregor yeah. Rocky and Tom Kalin. And that was a foundational moment for all of us, I think. And I think it set the climate of a kind of political subtext, at least, of the kind of movies that were coming out around HIV AIDS during the most panic, panicky time of the epidemic. And we weren't by nature activists yet. We weren't documentarians. We were emerging fiction filmmakers. And so, but it took everybody's ability, skills, instincts to reply to the urgency of that moment and to address it. But what was so interesting about Nuclear Cinema, and particularly myself and these guys, everybody actually in Nuclear Cinema, is that the films we were making were not about, oh, sweet little gay couples who could fit nicely in your living room and everybody would be unafraid. It was about criminality, deviancy. It was about using homosexuality as a cudgel against heteronormativity and a means of critiquing the status quo. It wasn't like we all got together in a room and decided that. That was just everybody's instincts. And that's where somebody like Jean Genet, for me, was such a confident voice to stand up to and against the status quo. This movie I saw in high school. Again, it was pure cinematic adrenaline. Of course, it bears the, the fingerprints of, of the Nicholas Rogue films that would continue through the 70s and that would be really important and informative and are really incredible films that would follow performance. But this had the hybrid of Donald Camel, who only made a few films and never became mm. as well known as Nicholas Rogue and Rogue, who was a cinematographer moving into the role of a director. I can't imagine any any lover of cinema or any director not being astonished and just sort of like turned on watching this movie. And I still feel that way. And this movie just changed the way we think of noir. Hello? How are you? Leaves you feeling a kind of existential doubt about <laughs> the world by the end of it. It almost makes you think, and no movies could 
could ever be made again after Chinatown. So it's just such a special film and so emblematic of what was happening in the United States in the mm. 70s in the reappraisal of genre. Uh, it was a inspiration, a first instinct for what Joaquin brought to me as a way of rethinking Chinatown, but making it a gay interracial relationship instead of a traditional femme fatale. And then we sort of deviated. The film's a little more last tango now than, okay. than <laughs> Chinatown. <laughs> And um, Blowjob, um, I, not right before uh, May, December, I made my first documentary about the Velvet Underground and spent a lot of time watching a lot of the Warhol films. But I've always found Blowjob to be a conceptually perfect film and a stunning experience where the real changes are as important as the reels themselves. What's left out of the film is everything. Uh, so it's a classic of the idea of minimalism and of the frame wanting you to imagine what is surrounding it, obviously, and never showing you and actually imbuing so much more power as a result, an erotic power, an erotic, erotic imaginative power by only showing the face yeah. of someone being filleted. This one? There we are. Kelly was also somebody I met on my production of Poison. I mean, I knew she was this just insanely smart, funny person, like nobody you've ever met. And then two, three years later, I turn around and she's created, she made her first feature film, River of Grass. And I didn't even know she was doing it, you know? I didn't know she had exactly those ambitions. And I think after that first feature film, it was hard. There was such a sense of the male dominated crew and hierarchy and so forth that she took a little break from features. And then Kelly visited me in Portland, Oregon, where I unexpectedly ended up in the year 2000 and unexpectedly stayed. And I introduced her to all my new friends in Portland. And she met John Raymond, who was my buddy, writer, amazing guy. And they started to collaborate. And their first film was uh, Old Joy. Sometimes things look like they don't have any order, and then from a different level, you realize that it does have order. And they just continued working in this way with each other. And then, you know, I'm proud of any way I've been a part of this uh, latest evolution of Kelly Reichert's career. But there's a documentary over there about a figure hub, which is yes. also important for you. Yes, it is. It's a documentary about David Bowie. And I have approached musical artists, I guess, in three different films of yeah. mine. Uh, Velvet Goldmine, it, which is a fiction, and it's a sort of parallel universe to the actual world of glam rock and uh, a kind of love affair between England and America. But a real um, acknowledgement, love story, Valentine, to this radical moment in pop culture where sexual roles and gender roles were inverted or just blurred. Androgyny and bisexuality has always been part of popular music and the arts, of course, but it had never been given such a front stage spotlight than it did in rock and roll during the glam era. And that mm. was so almost entirely due to Bowie, but not. It was also happening in various parallel ways around him and he was a sponge like Bob Dylan was. He was a sponge. He sucked up what was around him and he turned it back into his own art. And he couldn't have created Ziggy Stardust without his wife, Angela Bowie. So we made a movie that embraced all of it um, and had an amazing soundtrack as well and put all these beautiful young people in it and took all, all their clothes. Baby's on fire. And then a few years later, I found myself listening to Bob Dylan again in a way I hadn't since I was in high school in a sort of transitional period of my life. And I was like reading about, reading biographies on Dylan, which I had never done. And they were talking about this shapeshifter, this person mm. who was constantly changing, who never looked the same uh, from month to month and who would just suck into one thing and create all this music and sound like Woody Guthrie and act like Woody Guthrie and dress like Woody Guthrie and then <laughs> throw it away, kill it off. And I just thought that's how he survives. His celebrity, his fame, the unbelievable disproportionate amount of projection people were making onto him as a voice of his time, which is a 
which is a stifling, terrifying thing for an artist. He needed to breathe and keep making new work. So he had to live in a cons uh, residual state of murdering off himself, killing his past residually over and over again. And I thought, again, that recreation of yourself, that reinvention of yourself, that refusal to be the same person today that you were yesterday. You know, these are my, these are my positive examples of unstable identity. In my films about artists, there are more negative examples that also question the stability of identity, but that becomes sort of a through line, I guess, of all my work. But then I got to make a documentary about the Velvet Underground and turn to the avant-garde cinema that was being made in New York City in the 60s, which was the only record of this remarkable, yeah. informative band that changed what was possible in rock and roll. Lester Banks said, music will never be the same after the Velvet Underground. And it opened up a sense that you don't have to sing happy songs about love and, and feeling chipper and great. And you could talk about being in utter despair and wanting to hurt yourself. Young people felt those feelings. And so this band was describing feelings that had never really been expressed before in popular music. But it was in it was set against this incredible moment and time and place in New York City where all of this, you know, vital avant-garde cinema was being made and the Velvet Underground were part and parcel of all of that. So they were part of the art scene, they were part of the music scene, they were part of the film scene, and they were all exchanging ideas. You know, it was a small, relatively small group of people who were each other's, who were the dancer and the dance. <laughs> And they were all moving around and sharing this experience and creating work. And so I got to use that cinema to tell the story of that band. Also, the amazing photo uh, archives around. The amazing photographers who took beautiful stills of the Velvet Underground, usually in black and white. So that was an amazing experience. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Mini!